one of the big debates in the industry is how do I know whether or not I should use elements all the time? How often should I use attributes? Um, I find a lot of people like to go the 100% element route, and I'm not really for that approach. And I'll give you a few examples why, or more rules of thumb. The rule of thumb I apply to every XML schema that I get to create is that I use attributes at all time, times unless there's an element that's warranted. And I try to relate it to when I'm building a database table. So if I'm building an order header uh, table or a physical file, I define that, and then I add fields to that, obviously. And I consider fields attributes of that record or of that database table. Um, in the same respect, that's how I do it with an XML element. I consider each column or field to be an attribute of that element. Now, the exceptions of when you may want to uh, move away from having an attribute, um, one would be, obviously, you won't want to have a repeatable piece of data uh, being repeated as an attribute. And I'll go to the next slide here. That's what I mean. So you won't want to have something like this, where you have phone one, phone two, phone three, phone four, phone five, etc. Um, if you've got a repeating, repeating piece of data, instead of going horizontal with your data, uh, go vertical with it and create an element that is repeating. Um, if it's necessary to pass information that you do not want an XML parser to touch, uh, for instance, I like to use the example the word Johnson and Johnson that has an ampersand in it. Um, if you don't want the XML parser to touch any portion of that because it does have an ampersand and that's a reserved character uh, in XML, what you can do is wrap it around a C data tag. And that will tell the parser, oh, hands off, I'm going to skip over this until I get to the end of the tag. In that case, if you did need to use a C data tag, those are only valid in elements and not in attributes. So that would warrant the use of an element. Uh, which inherently means that most times when you're passing a string of text, it will become an element. Um, if there's a chance of needing future expansion or the data is complex, uh, for example, the, the postal address that we we're looking at, that is also a time where I uh, tend to lean more towards using a, a group of elements, so like a, a parent tag and a whole bunch of child tags. So then that gets uh, the ability to group together like minded tags. And you don't get a real good flavor of it with just this document, but when you get an XML document that's a few hundred lines long, it's nice to not have it all, um, you know, one parent tag and then 500 child tags. And the last one, and this is uh, something that might be a gotcha if you ever come across it. Um, there's a lot of different parsers out there, and they're all written by different people, much like there's a lot of different HTTP servers out there that are written by a variety of groups. Some HTTP servers uh, only allow certain amount of links to be passed in the URL when you're making a GET request. Um, and I won't go into the details of what a GET request is, but if, um, if you see a, a query string in your browser, which is the portion that comes right after the question mark when you're um, on eBay or whatnot, that's the, that's the query string. And, and some HTTP servers have limitations on how much data can actually be passed on that. Well, that's kind of a, a, a glass ceiling limitation. You don't know that it's there until you hit it. Well, in a like way, I like to put a, a limitation on how I use attributes and that I'm never going to use it for something that could potentially exceed 256 bytes of information. That's just a rule that I put in place within my own practices. Um, that one's kind of a, a take it or leave it, but just know that uh, potentially that limitation is there depending upon who wrote the parser that you're sending a document to, and then that programmer might be um, out of luck if they, if they uh, run into a length problem. So here's an example of extensive elements used, and here's an example of extensive attributes used. And uh, the between is something like this, where you know if it's simple values like this, go ahead and stick them into an attribute. If they're complex, like the name, obviously, uh, and for grouping purposes, so you know that these two tags belong to this one, uh, by all means, make it a, a complex data type and put them in their own grouping. Next, we have I've taken all the namespaces out of the examples so far, but um, we'll start showing them now. Namespaces are used to fully qualify something. Very vague, I know. 
something in an XML document. So some things are going to be either an XML element or an XML attribute. So I, I like to relate it to how in our shops we'll have two physical files and inevitably they'll both have the same um, column, same named column in them and inevitably they'll both be of different data types. So the first thing that we have to do once we've um, compiled it and got errors is put a prefix onto the front of that, um, all those columns within that table's uh, name. So now everything in here will be prefixed with an I and everything in here will be prefixed with an O and it will compile successfully. In the same way, uh, you have to put XML in your document when there's two different elements or attributes that have the same name but are defined differently. Um, the way you do that is you specify an attribute named XML and S for namespace. In most likely it's in the, the root element. So as you can see here we've got XML and S. And then you uh, specify a colon and then the prefix that you want to use, so this could be anything and everything including dog breath. And then you specify a namespace URI. Now the namespace URI is a convention that the standards people put in place and they meant for you to put your, your company's domain name in there. So if you develop the spec, you put your company's domain name in there. They did that because they figured, well, if you're on the web and uh, most likely you're a company, everybody's going to have their own unique URL. So let's just make that the standard by which we make things unique. Um, omitting the prefix out of this mix right here will mean that the default namespace is used. So sometimes you'll see documents that have for example, um, something that looks like this on every single tag. So you'll see a prefix colon tag, prefix colon tag, prefix colon tag, etc. These don't, but just for example. Excuse me. Um, you can get away from that for the majority of your tags if a lot of them are from the same namespace. So right here, excuse me again, oh, I need another drink. Right here we've got a namespace URI that points to uh, uh, my open source site. And it actually goes all the way out to an actual XSD. Now you don't need to have this. It's not used at runtime, but it does make it further unique for documentation purposes. Not that we need to have uh, additional documentation in XML, given its uh, already kind of bloated nature, but um, this does fully qualify this namespace, and now people will know that this envelope is the one that was developed by Mow Your Lawn. The way that we define a second namespace, by the way, you can only have one default, is to put the uh, XML NS colon vendor and then put your vendor's name in here, whoever developed that particular uh, schema definition. And then uh, you could stop right here and not include this, but it is um, semi-common practice to actually put the full link to the XSD in here. Again, not used at runtime, uh, purely for documentation purposes. So if we go in here um, and, and look at this document, we can see the reasoning behind it. We've got two phone elements. Here's the first phone element, and here's the second one. Now, obviously, we can see right away that they're defined in different ways, much like these columns are defined in different ways. So right here, I've got a 15 pack and a 15 alpha. Well, this phone has things more separated out, and this is our vendor's phone number that they might be passing to us. So this is an order that they're sending to us. And they've got the area code, phone number, and extension all split out, whereas um, Memorial Lawn's XSD just had it all splat into one field, um, so it's more of a free format text. By prefixing it, we are able to tell exactly which phone element we are dealing with at any given time. So that's how namespaces work. They're just meant to qualify uh, a particular element within an XML document. I'm going to take 20 seconds to see if there's any questions that absolutely have to be answered. One moment. <laughs> 